Okay, so, ladies and gentlemen, um, we're going to, uh, as I promised, um, just expose you to uh, um, one of the models that we posted, um, which uh, exhibits features of particle filtering. Um, and uh, I'll briefly orient you to it, and then we'll get into uh, a discussion of um, some additional points when it comes to particle filtering. So um, if you go to the course materials, you will find that uh, beyond the, the lecture slides and background materials, which I've posted, uh, which provides lots of uh, references um, and updates the schedule, um, you'll find that there's uh, an example models folder. And within the example models folder in turn, there's a particle filtering folder. And within that, you will find two particle filter models. Um, the first of them is the one at node uh, right now. It's part of particle filtering measles model with aggregated population. It's a zip, a zip folder. So if you were to download it and, and unpack it, um, what you will find is uh, a folder which uh, contains, uh, the folder is actually called here, and I'm gonna have to look, it's called Aggregated Model Final Used, I think. Um, and if you go into that, you'll find that there's an ALP file, that's an AnyLogic project file. If you were to go open that up, um, as I'd invite you to do, and I will do it whilst the same with you, um, following along. Incidentally, if you do get that splash screen, you can close it through a sort of minimize uh, thing here, minimize it down. But I'm gonna go open that folder up. Here we go. Here's my downloads. I'm going and I'm opening that up. It's going to show me one of the models that actually on which Xiaoyan presented yesterday. And you can see it before you. It's a measles model. It divides people with measles into a set of four categories. Those who are susceptible, those who are exposed, those who are infectious, and indeed those who are recovered. Now, beyond those categories involving the population, which count the number of people in each category, we have two other factors that are part of model state, part of the current situation of the model. One is, relates to um, a uh, parameter related to uh, transmissibility of the disease. Um, this, um, it says log disease transmission rate. Um, it's actually, I think that's actually the contact. But, well, it's combined contact rate and, and transmission. Uh, probability. This log disease, it's log transformed so it can go from minus infinity to plus infinity in a so-called random walk. You can adjust above zero and below zero. And, and then there's this fraction of reported incidents which also evolves. This one, in, the log disease, um, uh, the, the, the effective contact rate which combines a contact rate and a probability of transmission given contact that can go from zero to infinity. So we take a log value to make it between minus infinity and plus infinity. This uh, reported incident per month, that's something that's between zero and one. It's, it's, a, it's a probability that an incident will be reported. Um, and so to, to have the transform value go between minus infinity and plus infinity, it's, it undergoes what's called a logit transform, uh, which some of you may be familiar with from biostatistics or other areas. Um, now, um, beyond that, there's, there's something which is just used to total up values um, right here. Um, okay, so uh, I would just note, while I have no intention of, of going through this model in profound, uh, whoa, oh, profound detail. Uh, oh, uh, mumble. Did it, hello? Um, okay, did I just close it or? Um, Mumble, okay, um, uh, let me just see if I moved it uh, to some obvious place. No, 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 where'd it go, hey. Um, 
Okay, well, uh, maybe I closed it. That's that was uh, one left swipe. Um, okay, so I'm going to call up uh, any logic again, and we will. And I need a later version of any logic for this, so forgive me for just a second while I just go and get up any logic. Okay, there we go. So this model, you may notice if you start to explore it, most of the variables in the model, or a large fraction of them, are, are actually not just one value. They're what's called subscripted, meaning that there's a different value for them for each particle, okay? So I'll, I'll call it up here again, and uh, it's not there. Okay, so uh, let me go back to my downloads again. There we are. There we are. Okay. I don't know what I did. Okay. Um, you'll notice that each of these is subscripted. It's subscripted by particle, meaning each particle has a separate value for the number of susceptible a separate value for the number of exposed, a separate value for the number of infectious, and a separate value for the number of recovered, and indeed for these ones as well. This relates to the fact that every particle has, it posits some particular state of the system. It has a hypothesis that I think there's, you know, as a particle number two, I think there's a certain number of susceptible people, exposed people, infectious people, recovered people, and a certain value for this log C, and a certain value for the load shed of, of the reported fraction. And I'm, that's my stance right now. At this time, I think that's the current situation. Another particle will posit something different. And we're each competing for our ability to, to account for the data that's coming in. Over time, I as this particle and going to evolve. I'm going to evolve according to the logic of the model. Jeff will like this. So I, I'm a particle, and you know I, I'm going to go up in my value and down in my value, and um, you know grow and and then um, and then a new data point is going to come in, and I'm going to be judged for how much I think. Uh, how much my um, prediction of the current model state is consistent with that data point. When I say the particle is going up and down in value, actually, there's one sense in which particles' weights are going up and down as new observations come in. But a particle is depicting a hypothesis for the entire model. So we can't really say its value is greater or lesser according to the model. But it's, it's evolving according to the model's um, logic and so the number of uh, associated with the particle the number susceptible right now now might be something but over time it might be dropping while the number of exposed individuals say is rising and then dropping in turn for that particle between the observations the particles just evolving so each particle needs a separate value for each of these uh, each of these states here okay and you, you won't see it initially because this model is currently set up to have exactly one particle. <laughs> uh, and if you want to see it in action, you will need to go here. You know, notice there's this thing that says dimension. You need to go down to particle and you'll need to change this to something more fitting. Um, and um, if you want to see a model run really quickly, you could change it to 99, in which case there'll only be 100 particles. Or if you want to see it run with uh, in a more stately but robust way, you could change it to 999 or even 9,999. Um, maybe I'll do it at 99 right now. Um, okay, no, I don't want to save that. Um, I'm going to go here. And now I will run it. I will run it in particle filtered mode using this experiment here. Um, I think pure is just uh, no particle filtering. It's the baseline. It's particle filter is turned off. This guy is particle filtering turned on. We can run it. And by right clicking on it and choosing run. And you will see this model engaged in animated behavior. It's a, it's exhibiting uh, particle filtering. 
if we pause it at any one point, I'll go down here and pause, you'll notice that at any one point, each particle is positing something different about the number susceptible. One particle is saying there's 98,501 people. Uh, particle six is saying, nah, there's 100, over 100,000. This other particle five is saying there's 97,000. Each of those particles also is taking a stand with respect to how many are exposed. Um, you'll notice there's quite a variety. This one feels there's uh, 52 people exposed. Um, uh, this particle says there's only 24. And similarly on the number of infectious. So each particle has a certain view of the world, a certain hypothesis for what's going on right now. It posits a certain situation right now. And that induces things like force of infection, where each particle believes there's a different force of infection, for example, uh, applying. Uh, now, over time, uh, this is going to evolve. Uh, these, each of these bars here are showing the first five particles, I believe. Um, so you know, notice that, for example, uh, this is the first five. This one, this one is the first particle is positing something a larger number of infectious people than the second, 24 versus 20. And you could see it on. You'll notice that as it runs, they rise and fall. Um, so, uh, you know, over time it's, and it's renormalizing the graph, but fundamentally there's dynamics going on in terms of the particles uh, involved. Now, if you were to click on this and drag upwards, you will actually see incoming data and some of those graphs like yesterday, here you see in red the empirical data. You can, you can put your mouse over this, it will show you the empirical data in red. And if you put your mouse over simulation output, you will see, it may be faint, it may be too light for you to see, but on this board is being etched, even as we speak, the evolution of a distribution in terms of model expectations of how many individuals will be getting sick over time. And you can see it trying to track, for example, this outbreak. It only has 99 particles and it's a bit faint. But up here you will see uh, the model's distribution for the number of susceptibles at a given time. If we were to pause it, there's some distribution here. It looks like it's a rather tight one here, 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 etc. Okay. Um, so this is a, uh, a model, model involving uh, particle filtering. Um, there's a set of mechanisms. Uh, this, this model was, uh, there's a template I use which to distribute to people. I'm glad to share it. In fact, I think I will share it. It will comment on how you can adapt a particle filtering model, what things you can, um, you can take directly, what things you have to adapt, what things you have to write yourself. But, Fundamentally, Xiao Yan has equipped this with some additional things, for example, some features to force resampling or report values and things, which make it easy to debug, I think. Uh, do you want to say anything about that? Yeah. So, so for, the, for example, for the reporting, um, maybe it's currently disabled or something like that. Um, but this does show uh, some of the structure of a model. Here, it actually does report, look at that, for every particle, it's reporting the value of the four stocks, I think. So if you push this, it, it, it will uh, report these, um, these out, I believe, which are, if I'm not mistaken, the value of the stocks. Um, so, uh, you know, I'd be glad to go into how these are implemented for, um, uh, for interested parties, but this gives you a bit of a flavor for those who are interested in uh, engaging in electronic exploration rather than leading, listening to my conceptual material, you're welcome to explore this. I would note that if you were to increase the number of particles by a factor of roughly 10 to 9.99, um, uh, here, um, you can see it running. It's going to be slower in its deliberations. Um, 
it's simulating a thousand different hypotheses at any one time. Let a thousand flowers bloom. And um, here, once again, it's engaged in seeking to trace the behavior of each data point. And that's why there's the blue uh, linking those up, which you might be able to see a little bit better with that. And um, the models, um, uh, the model's characterization of the situation and some of the basic settings for it are shown over here at the, on the right-hand side. Um, some of these, for example, will bear on how confident it is of its interpretation. This, this is a dispersion parameter here that we'll be talking about, for example, and making this smaller will make it wider likelihood distribution, which will mean that it will be less constrained in interpretation by the values received. Yes? So, so in the model structure, where is the empirical data coming in? Mm, good question. So um, I, I know where it was in my own, but I will go and take a look here. I have a feeling it's it's over here. But Chayan, do you want to say in your particular model? It's probably in a ta table function. Over here. Oh, this this one, the ta table function. Okay, I can't see its name, but oh, here it is. Yeah, there it is. There we are. Yeah. So here, we'll we'll show it. There it is. It lies before us in all its beauty. So this is saying for each time point, what what value of the. Um, what is the value received uh, in terms of the number of observed cases of illness for that week? No, for that month, one month. Um, and, and it's going to try to track these values over time. Um, these are the empirical observations. Now, Lucia will be giving a talk later today, um, which I think is one of the most exciting talks ever given in any boot camp I've been um, uh, in terms of its import. But what he's going to be showing this afternoon is how instead of putting this data in to the model directly, just placing it as part of the model and, and having the model trace this out, instead he's constructed a system through, through uh, considerable months of innovation and working within the constraints of any logics quirks. He's constructed a system so this data streams in over time from internet data sources and it actually updates the model as a new data point is received. It'll update that and run it forward um, waiting for the new data point, allowing it to detect the evolution of the system, as it were, in real time as new data is received. And this comes, this uh, allows us to approach this idea of having a decision support mechanism based around these models, where the models are kept abreast of the latest data. When new data points come in, they advance our thinking about what's likely to play out in the next little bit of time. They shed light on what's going on right now. They illumine the current situation. And each time new evidence is arrived, without human hands, the model incorporates that. Christine, this is the first boot camp Christine has has um, has ever had to sit through all of it, and and now she realizes the full horror. Oh. <laughs> um, but I, I think it'll give her some some insights. Um, okay, so ladies and gentlemen, you're welcome to. to uh, any other questions about this model before I go into some of the conceptual material? that will pin down more what particle filtering is doing and how it works. Yeah. 
Any more questions about this? Okay. Um, we have to thank Xiao Yan. Xiao Yan, yesterday, on the spur of the moment, um, I asked her, could she post her model? And she just went and did it. And it's, it's a very nice model. It's a very nicely done, clean, clean model. And um, I'm indebted to her for, for having put that in place so quickly and, and um, with so little fuss and muss, okay? Um, so that's our, uh, that's our, our 